dear Paul, dear Tattoo, friends and colleagues, first of all, I want to thank you very much to invite also some exotic person to this wonderful session. I believe I am the first on a social science-based person. I am an economist and even worse, I was a politician. One of those never echoing correctly to your findings, all of those responsible for not making enough funds available for all what you have to study. So please, there must be a reason that I was invited. And honestly, it was a fact that I was once a politician here in Mainz. I was not directly a federal minister, but I started on the rhineland palatinat level. And I was a neighbor to Paul Kruzen. And uh, I learned a lot, and later, when I had the chance to be a federal minister, it was just the time of the discussion on the ozone layer, on ozone. And that was my experience of Paul Kruzen. Yes. He is an outstanding scientist. He is a Nobel Prize laureate. But he is a person crossing borders. If he is convinced, he is a campaigner as well. And he was a campaigner. Honestly, we always learn from IPCC, they have to be politically relevant, but not political prescriptive. With regard to Paul, forget this. He is one and the other. He is political relevant and political prescriptive, if he is convinced to do so. And this was my experience in those days with uh, ozone activities. By the way, together with our, my pre predecessor as UNEP director, Mustafa Tolba, really a fighter, and that gave the chance to make the Vienna Convention a reality and to integrate later the Montreal Protocol and, most important, mainly forgotten, it was also the chance to integrate the multilateral fund. These are the three ingredients for coming for a global solution, wherever you are. If you cannot have the convention, a strong protocol and a financial mechanism, it would not be possible. And believe me, without Paul, it was not possible to bring the Germans in the right track in this field. Paul is really a person being responsible for a Max Planck Institute. This means something in Germany. But he is somebody who also has a chance to reduce complexity so that he can address the broader public. And this is, by the way, one of the challenges also politicians are confronted with. It seems to me to be very necessary to mention this. Yes, we need the scientific language, but if we want to be relevant in the political arena, we have also the use the language of those you have to convince we are in a very clear situation of open democracy. But I have it as a topic, but I want to mention this in the very beginning. Otherwise, you couldn't understand why I'm here. Mainly, as a former politician and only an economist, I'm not using slides. But I was convinced and I was strongly recommended, today you need slides. If you have no slides, you are not a scientific person and therefore you are really criticized for this. So I do something and you will see I'm not really the expert, but I listen very carefully to um, Paul Krutzen, not too many. So sustainability. Sustainability in the Anthropocene, that's the right title. Eh? 
Of course, you have to ask, what the devil is sustainability? And uh, this is very inter interesting just in this year, 2013, to ask the question here in Germany. Because exactly 300 years ago, there was, if you want to say it, the birth time for sustainable development. It was a publication of a book. You cannot read it, but believe it. It is named Silvi Cultura Economia. The author, Hans Karl von Karlowitz. I'm fairly sure you don't know him. And that is the reason that I mention him, that you can learn a little bit also from a social scientist. What was this man, this Karl, Hans Karl von Karlowitz, writing a book on the cultivation of forests? He was not, as you may imagine, a forester. But he was the main person responsible for the mining industry in the Saxonia in those days. Saxonia, a state on the eastern border of Germany, is well known in those days to be the mining district in the world. It was linked with a mountain called in Germany the Erzgebirge, the mountain of minerals. And the immense richness of the ruler of Saxonia, the Kurfürst August Der Starke, was linked with the fact that in this mountain of minerals was a lot of silver. And this Hans Karl von Karlewitz was responsible to make this silver available for his boss. And he was confronted with the crisis of resources of energy in his time. For mining, he need wood. For the melting process, he need wood for energy. And he saw that the big forests of Saxonia went down. And he came to a conclusion that will be a difficulty in the near future because we don't have enough wood to go on with our activities. And so he sat down and wrote this book. And I cannot go into all the detail, don't be afraid. But he came to the normal reaction to a crisis until today. He asked, what is about efficiency? Can we use wood better? I don't go in detail. I know that uh, our friend Schulze has a copy of this 300 years old book, so please, if you want to read it, go to him. He asked for substitution. Do we have other topics for energy, for example? He singled out that peat would be a good chance for it. He wrote a whole chapter on peat. He did not mention very intensively sufficiency. To have this limitation was not his main idea. A little bit, but not really. And he came to engineering. What kind of an engineering in his time? Of course, if you have the perspective, you can only harvest as much of those forests as it is replanted. You ask which trees are growing fastest. So he came to the conviction that spruce monoculture would be a good chance. If we take all these together, it is not what our friend from the ecological side named sustainable. Why? Nevertheless, he is a father of sustainability. He mentioned the first time that you have to consider the consequences of our activity, not only for today, but also for the time to come. He in integrated the dimension of time in his decision making. And I want to quote a philosopher, a Jewish German philosopher, Hans Jonas, saying, our knowledge must be equivalent to the extent of our actions. And then we are directly 300 years later. That is the main topic to ask. Is that our situation, that we, our knowledge is equivalent to the extent of our action at time where we have, in modern science, an acceleration of knowledge accumulation, where there should be 
a longer decision-making period, having in mind the need for also calculate the medium and long-term consequences. The opposite is right. We are going always on nearly the real-time decisions, and where we have the building blocks of nature and life discovered. This is the jump 300 years from Karl from Karlowitz ask for the medium and long-term consequence of your action to what is 300 years later, which brings us to the Anthropocene. And it was wonderful to see that Time magazine, in two editions, made a cover. This was ideas that are changing the world, and the other is 10 ideas that are changing your life. I give you only two examples. The first, sharing economy. Today's smart choice, don't own, share. If this is going, this has a huge consequences of what we mentioned in the very beginning for the footprint of mankind. If you come to a sharing economy, I know I have only 25 minutes, so I have to hurry. The second brings us back to Paul. The idea, nature is over. Nature is over. I was courageous enough to mention this in my keynote speech at the 20 years anniversary of our Federal Agency of Nature Protection. Was some reaction, I can inform you. <laughs> Nature is over. What is that? What is the consequence of this little, that's not Paul Krutzen, that is Time Magazine, as mentioned. But if you go on, ah, was the wrong one. And you see what is mentioned in this outstanding article in Nature 2002, Geology of Mankind. You come also to those, it's no longer us against nature. Instead, it's we who decide what nature is and what it will be. That's the Anthropocene. And this has, of course, huge consequences. I have here now a chapter in my manuscript explaining what that means. What is nature protection? What is wildlife? What is wilderness in such a sentence? What are the consequences? Lots of peer-reviewed articles are published on this question. I quote only an article by Chris Thomas in Nature, article in October 2030, where he underlines that specialization by hybridization will be the consequences of a development in this direction. Is that true? Do we have still biomes or do we have anthroomes? Also mentioned by other. A huge consequence and I can only tick it on. Needless to say, this is the Anthropocene and others especially this Potsdam Memorandum, name it, that mankind is a quasi-geological force. This was. And Paul comes to the conclusion, I stick again to the same article in Nature, a daunting task like lies ahead for scientists. You can read it yourself, and your English is better than mine. It is the question how to manage this Anthropocene. Is sustainability in the Anthropocene linked with engineering? Is that the answer? And is this answer linked with the question whether due to previous decision we are more or less in a past dependency so that we are reducing our chances for decision-making to have alternatives. I think the need for sustainability in the Anthropocene, of course, needs, without any doubt, the scientists, the engineers. But we have also to make clear that there must be the development of options for action for different ways to develop the future life on Earth. Let me give you one, some, Example only with a headline. 
changing lifestyle, sharing instead of owing, sufficiency, close cycles in the use of raw materials and energy, altogether to cancel the so-called TINA principle, there is no alternative. We are living more and more in a world where there are no alternatives. The bad word in Germany in the year 2020 was without alternatives. And this has huge consequences for the range and for the perspective of democracy. Hannah Arendt, a well-known philosopher, once mentioned, being able to start is at the core of freedom. Are we free when we have to say this or that is without alternatives? This is the main challenge we are confronted with in the Anthropocene, in my assessment right now. What is the dimension of time? Knowing that human decisions are always decisions with incomplete information. Complete information is a divine attribute. What is our role with regard to the precaution principle? Lots of people are fighting heavily against the precaution principle. And believe me, being eight years responsible for UNEP, negotiating those wonderful protocols like the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, give you lots of nights of your life to negotiate the uh, precautionary principle. It was not very easy to convince our friends from the United States of America and others to accept the precautionary principle that we negotiated already in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro. A lack of scientific knowledge shall not prevent cost-effective measures. Is that also a part of the Anthropocene? What are the consequences about that? And I could go on, for example, especially let me mention this finally, the consequences of the knowledge democracy. Integrating social knowledge in the scientific process in order to cope with the wicked problems and transform scientific insights to robust, plausible action perspectives, how to come to a transdisciplinarity approach, which I learned first and foremost from Paul Crutzen, because he crossed the border to civil society he was open for their activities. Transdisciplinarity is that a need, especially in an Anthropocene. Let's come to the last topic. And therefore, for this, I need Mark Lawrence here. You know, we, I'm happy to be the founding director of the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies. In Potsdam, we have a, a management board with three persons, three directors. One, of course, Hurst, Carlo Rubia, Nobel Prize laureate, quite a challenge. Then Mark, young, dynamic, concentrated to those topics you are discussing here, and a good student, a scholar from Paul and from Ram and we are happy to have him in our institute and myself, and we discuss how we can uh, give a little present to Paul Krutzen. Because this idea, we are at the very beginning of the process to come to this foundation of the institutes. And we have to consider how to bridge the gap between scientific findings and the integration in the society and in political implementation, and this all was linked with Paul Krutzen, and therefore we decided to ask Paul Krutzen to be our first honorable senior fellow at the Institute, and it was agreed unanimously, and Mark will now read out the uh, wonderful uh, letter we sent to you. So we start off with a quote from Paul, quite a famous one. Paul, you'll recognize this. We are no longer in the Holocene. We are in the Anthropocene. 
The Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies hereby proudly bestows the title of Honorary Senior Fellow on Professor Dr. Paul Crutzen for outstanding contributions to our understanding of the Earth system in the Anthropocene. Given your role as a visionary and agenda-setting scientist, the IASS feels privileged and honored to have been associated with you since its formation. We look forward to a long and fruitful relationship with you as Honorary Senior Fellow.